Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 651, for the 4th of April 2021. Richard Saunders coming to you from sunny, sunny, sunny Sydney, Australia. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're having at least some sort of little break over Easter to enjoy yourself, to uh, maybe go for a nice walk. If you're lucky enough to live by the ocean, you can walk down by the ocean, see the crowds, well, depending on where in the world you are, I guess. No matter what you're doing, I hope you're having a good time. Coming up on this week's show, it's once again Adrian Hill with You Can Count on Adrian. Adrian is going to tell us about her battle with migraines and something uh, with which I sympathize because starting when I was about 13, 12, something like that, I have also suffered from migraines, not so much in the late years, not so much in the uh, past two decades. They were on the decline quite a lot. But certainly when I was a teenager into my 20s, the migraine uh, would come, the migraines would come frequently. And if you have never had one, good luck to you. Uh, But those who do get migraines know exactly what I mean. They can be dreadful simply dreadful. And I I sort of know when one's coming on, even if it's sometimes it's a painless migraine. Sometimes there's distortion in in the visual field, so to speak, which is a bit weird. But abilities, simple thinking abilities are thrown out the window. Concentration says goodbye and goes on a little trip. Um, It's hard to do basic things like spell words or arithmetic. What a weird thing. Anyway, Adrian Hill will tell us about her experiences with migraines, and it ties in, sort of, with logical fallacies along the way. Maybe you too will sympathise. Following that, it's the newsletter from Australian Skeptics. See what's caught the sceptical eye of sceptical Tim Mendham this week, or last week actually, because it was held over from the week before, because the week before the show was a little long. Anyway, sceptical newsletter... Then it's an update on the COVID-19 clunkers. The COVID-19 conspiracy theories collected at covidconspiracy.cloud. Now you can click this link on the show notes at skepticzone.tv. It takes you to a web page where people have uploaded screen captures and photographs of crazy COVID conspiracy theories and bad medical advice. And this might be timely because I see from reports around the world There could be a new surge of COVID-19. In fact, I think there is in certain places in the world. Following that, it's a quick visit by the sceptical fairy godmother angel from the internet who's going to remind us that we can still watch sceptical events online. Then, to round off the show, it's a trip to Trove, the treasure trove of digitised newspapers and so on from Australia. This week, we're going to be looking at references to superstitions published in Australian newspapers over the decades. Is it bad luck to listen to the Skeptic Zone while mowing the lawn? Well, I don't think so. Who knows? Stay tuned at the end of the episode for a very important announcement from me, but now it's time for me to run downstairs. Maybe there'll be a chocolate Easter egg in the fridge? I'll find out. While I do that, I hope you enjoy the Skeptic Zone. You can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill. I am going to talk about a more personal story today that involves some of the logical fallacies I have heard on the Skeptic Zone over the past year. Watch out for the argument from personal experience, cherry picking, correlation does not mean causation, and the use of anecdotal evidence. I know that there are some of you out there who will sympathize with this report. I have suffered from migraine headaches with some mind-bending auras for most of my life. What is a migraine? 
Well, according to the Mayo Clinic, migraine can cause severe throbbing pain or a pulsing sensation, usually on one side of the head. It's often accompanied by nausea, vomiting, and extreme sensitivity to light and sound. These attacks can last hours or days, and many people experience a warning aura. I am not referring to the apparent glow of an energy field that some psychics claim to be able to see around people. I am referring to strange visual and other nervous disturbances that occur prior to a migraine happening. My auras have ranged from the common zigzag through the center of my vision to looking at myself in the mirror and seeing my jaw and eyes shift so I looked like a Picasso painting. One of the more amusing ones I had, they can be amusing before the pain hits, was sitting at our kitchen table with a friend and his eyes moved completely off his face. After watching the wonder of eyes floating in the room for a while, I excused myself to take my medication to help reduce the symptoms that were likely to come within the next hour. There is a lot of debate about the causes or triggers of migraine. There is nothing new about many of the conjectures. According to neurologist Oliver Sacks in his book titled Migraine, he states that over 300 years ago, Thomas Willis, an English doctor, described migraine attacks as an evil or weak constitution of the parts, sometimes innate and hereditary, an irritation in some distant member of viscera, changes of season, atmospheric states, the great aspects of the sun and the moon, violent passions, and errors in diet. To this day, diet and weather are two of the most talked about possible triggers that I encounter in casual conversation. Most neurologists I have seen over the years have asked me to track my migraines to try to determine triggers, though my first neurologist told me I had little hope to avoid them since both of my parents suffer from them, and two of my three children get them, continuing the hereditary trend. So, 35 years ago, when I was first diagnosed with migraine, I began charting them, usually in six-month spurts. Over the past three years, I haven't missed a day. Years ago, I tried many diet changes, no sugar, no nitrites, no alcohol, no caffeine, which were prescribed by a naturopath before I knew that ND stands for not a doctor, and it seemed to work. Did I finally find my answer? Unfortunately, no. The migraines always returned with a vengeance. At the end of my sugar and caffeine deprivation and a week of terrible migraines, I decided to have a great chocolate feast. Surprisingly, the migraine stopped. Should I conclude that eating large amounts of chocolate is the answer? I think most people would laugh at the conclusion and know that this would be a ridiculous thing to do. But when it comes to the weather, this seems to be a common approach. I live in Calgary, Alberta, where Chinook winds and severe temperature changes are the norm. A Chinook is a warm and gusty westerly wind that originates in the Pacific Northwest and moves over the mountains and meets with the prairie cold. There is a distinct arch visible in the clouds and large temperature swings from cold to warm within 24 hours or less are typical. If someone gets a migraine the day of a Chinook, most people I talk to automatically attribute the cause to the change in barometric pressure that results from the weather. This hypothesis led me to a question. If it is the barometric pressure, then does traveling over a mountain pass or flying in an airplane trigger a migraine? For many years I have asked, with genuine interest, this question of people who tell me their migraines are triggered by Chinooks. Only two have said yes. On the other hand, one of my friends, unbeknownst to me, decided to track her migraines after me asking these questions. She told me a few months later, to her surprise, there didn't seem to be a link after all. Recently, it was suggested to me by a medical practitioner that my March month of terrible migraines was caused by severe weather fluctuations and not by my new antidepressant. She stated that this issue was published in our local news. As I said, I log my migraine symptoms, medication taken, and severity of pain, so it was easy to compare the weather pattern history with my chart. What I found was that during my six-day stretch of migraine, the weather was very stable. It did not fluctuate much at all. The previous month, however, had some crazy temperature swings, and I had only one migraine. To be clear, I really do not know if Chinooks can cause migraines. I am not a neurologist. 
I just know they don't for me after years of tracking, comparing, and discussing with specialists. In a 2013 review called Migraine and Triggers, Post Hoc Ergo Proctor Hoc, by Hoffman and Ricober, experts don't seem to be sure either. In the review, it was found to be possible that low temperature combined with relative high humidity and low atmospheric pressure may be associated with an increased incident of migraine attacks in a subgroup of migraineurs. What I found interesting here is that with the Chinook, the temperature goes dramatically up, not down. And the review has the usual statement included when studies have small sample sizes or are retrospective and self-reporting in nature. Results need confirmation by larger, carefully controlled, and designed clinical studies with long observational periods to exclude potential confounding factors. Another thing that has puzzled me for years is why I have never heard people in Calgary blame their migraines on the severe thunderstorms we get here every spring and summer. At least I don't remember anyone claiming that thunderstorms cause their migraine. The temperature and wind speed can change dramatically in a very short period. Yes, this has been studied too. Most of the studies suffer from small sample size and conclude it may be possible there is a connection, but better and larger studies are needed. Now let's get back to my favorite subject, chocolate. My cure has been blamed as a trigger for as long as I can remember. However, according to Lee Tompkins, director of the Migraine Action Society in the UK, it is common for many people to crave sweet things prior to getting a migraine. People will crave the chocolate, then get a migraine, blaming the onset of an attack on the chocolate. However, the attack may have already been on its way, and it may have been the migraine brain that induced you to eat the chocolate. Besides chocolate, some of the most common food culprits blamed for triggering migraine are cheese, monosodium glutamate, aspartame, coffee, and alcohol. Investigating food triggers is difficult since accurate records must be kept and one needs to be cautious of the cause and effect issue already discussed around chocolate. A so-called migraine diet has made its rounds in migrainer communities and with health gurus for several decades. It involves being on an elimination diet that occurs over long periods of time to help identify possible triggers. According to the Hoffman and Recobers review, there is no scientific evidence for a person to adopt this dietary trend. In fact, according to them, advising patients to avoid triggers can lead to a restrictive lifestyle that can cause an increase in stress and frustration. Instead, they recommend a balance of trigger avoidance and coping mechanisms. Neurologist Stephen Novella on the Science-Based Medicine website has found that caffeine is one of the most common triggers he sees in patients, and it is easy to test. If caffeine is needed to get rid of a headache, caffeine withdrawal is most likely the culprit, and he recommends no caffeine for several weeks to see if migraine frequency declines. One of my favorite anecdotes was him discussing patients on his Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast, where he asked people how many cups of coffee they had every day, and they answered in pots, not cups. Probably not a good idea, even for people without migraine. Do Chinooks, chocolate, and caffeine trigger migraines? Maybe. I have learned to be cautious of anecdotal evidence and have learned to carefully track my symptoms with the guidance of my neurologists. I have learned that migraines can happen despite having a good diet and regular exercise. I have learned that migraines are complex and vary from person to person. And turning the corner to realizing I probably have no control over when I get a migraine has released me and maybe Chinook's chocolate and caffeine from blame. Hey folks, Maynard here. I hope you're all enjoying your sceptical time with Richard here. Man, there's a lot of learned listeners to this show, but do you know who sang Rockabilly Rebel and how well that charted in Finland? That's pretty important stuff you need to know. You never know when you're going to need that kind of stuff. So how about you come along and join Richard and I at the amazing We Don't Care quiz. The title says it all. We don't care. If you don't like the questions, we don't care. 
If you don't know the answers, we care even less, if you can say that grammatically. But that's what's going to be happening. We don't care. And if you want to find out when it's on, it's on at 8.30 live. Play along live with us on the live stream video at Maynard's Facebook page. That's me. Or maynard.com.au. There's a link there on the front. See you later. Come on. Let's hear it for Finnish Pop. It's time to see what's caught the eye of sceptical Tim Mendham, the editor and executive officer of the Australian Skeptics, via the Australian Skeptics newsletter, newsletter number 119. Hi, all it says, as the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines picks up steam, we'll see how hesitant Australians are getting vaccinated. A rush on GPs now is only indicative of the majority who have always said that they will get it. We'll have to wait for some more months before the true situation becomes apparent. But in the meantime, we'll always have Mullumbimby. Read on. And news items covered in this newsletter are Australia's anti-vax capital. Profile of the Mullumbimby community of the north coast of New South Wales. Skeptics quoted. And remember that each story also includes a link when you subscribe to the newsletter. Canadian Conservative Party votes not to recognise climate crisis as real. A very short article which is short on detail. Not sure if they are against the concept of anthropogenic climate change per se, or just the crisis part. Oregon and Pseudoscience interesting historical article on the Austrian physicist William Reich, Orgon Energy Accumulator. And uh, as an aside, yes, you can still buy Orgon Energy devices. I know here in Australia, I've come across those quite a few times. Ban this wicked pseudoscience. Gay conversion therapy is not just a practice amongst fundamental Christian groups. This Jewish blogger describes his experiences. Has the Canterbury Panther mystery been solved? New Zealand's Canterburyans, i.e. around Christchurch, have long questioned whether large cats are on the loose in the South Island. Now there may finally be an answer, thanks to DNA. But don't get your hopes up. Sailing sceptically. Anyone with a few days to spare in mid-2022 may fancy a cruise through Northern Europe on the Soothsayers Cruise Club. Quote, Time to look forward to getting together for an adventure. Join your fellow skeptics for a celebration of fun, food and free thinking on a 12-night Baltic cruise aboard the brand new Celebrity Apex from the 20th of July to the 1st of August 2022. Hopefully mentioning cruise and Europe in the same breath will not be as big a worry next year as it was last. The March 2021 issue of The Skeptic, the journal from Australian Skeptics, is out with a major feature on various mind control techniques and the pseudoscience behind them. Also included are an in-depth look at biodynamics, a study on omens and prophecies, a classic map of early Australian exploration reinterpreted, contact with extraterrestrials and the early results of a major study on psychic predictions. Who's right, who's wrong, and who's jumped onto the wrong horse? And there's a link there so you can subscribe to the journal itself. The newsletter also lists upcoming events such as Canberra Skeptics, Sydney Skeptics in the Pub, Queensland Skeptics, Adelaide Critical Thinkers in the Pub, Victorian Skeptics Cafe, Gold Coast Skeptics, Perth Skeptics, and more. And we end with security cameras record paranormal activity in Texas home. We don't normally link to ghost videos and photos. We get them every day, and they tend to be the same, so vague and amorphous as to be not worth investigating. For example, what am I supposed to be looking at? Obvious double exposures with clear natural explanations. Spiders on security cameras is a common one, or blatant fakes. 
but we thought we'd throw this one into the mix just for the record, and in case you haven't seen one lately. Ask a few questions. Why do these things only move one way? Strings pulling? Why are all these security cameras in odd locations around the house? To film what's going to happen? And how can that dog sit down so calmly after witnessing a paranormal event? My pet human's doing something silly again? Honestly, these are pretty typical. Now you can subscribe to the Australian Skeptics newsletter by visiting www.skeptics.com.au and signing up. Hi, this is Rob Palmer. I write the well-known Skeptic column in Skeptical Inquirer Online, and I'm a team member of the Guerrilla Skeptics on Wikipedia Project, GSOW. But you fine folks may know me because I contributed segments for several episodes of this podcast. Check out my interviews from PsychOn 2019, starting with episode 576. So here's a little known fact. All of my skeptical activism stems from discovering the Skeptic Zone. Yep, I first heard of the GSOW project right here back in 2012 due to Richard's selfless support of it and other skeptical activities around the world. I can honestly say I'd likely still be a skeptical couch potato if I hadn't discovered this podcast. So besides giving back to the zone by contributing occasional segments, I contribute to the success of the show with ongoing monthly micropayments. And I'm asking you to consider doing the same. You can do that by following the Patreon or PayPal links at skepticzone.tv. Every donation supports the show, and Richard will really appreciate it. Now I think... It was about this time last year, or maybe, it's hard to say, maybe May or June. Isn't it strange how the year gets away from you, especially with such a crazy year as 2020, that I suggested a website be set up to collect all the coronavirus conspiracy theories, to catalogue them, to have them archived so people could reference them. And that came to fruition in the form of coronaconspiracy.cloud. And that link is on each week's show notes. And I thought it was time I had a quick look to see what, over the last few months, what new coronavirus conspiracies and nonsense has been uh, put on Facebook or on the internet in general, road signs, whatever. And I'm delighted to say, in a funny sort of way, there are lots of entries here. People have been uploading things to coronaconspiracy.cloud. Well, let's see now. Here's a classic one. COVID-19 is a false flag operation to usher in new world order. And another one here from last year. Somebody standing next to a giant banner. It says COVID-19 is a false flag operation to usher in the new world order. There we are again. They are forging death certificates to inflate the figures. Do your research. Say no to martial law, mandatory vaccinations, one world currency, cashless society. So it's really good that people are actually taking photographs of these things in the street, as it were, and posting them to this archive. Here we have another one. Let's see what it says. I'll click the link. All you have to do when you go to coronaconspiracy.cloud is you click the uh, thumbnail, or you can do a search. And up pops the item in question, plus a little bit of background Here's one from Facebook, it would appear. Coronavirus cocktail. Healy Medical Board. Golden Circle Pure. Fitness Circulation. Meridian 2 Lymphatic System. Bioenergenic Balance 1 Immune System. Bioenergenic Balance 2 Bacteria. Deep Cycle. Clean All. Gold Cycle. Care. Running these frequency programs daily to keep an immune system in tip top shape. Healthy Frequency Healing Australia. Wow. And the person who's uploaded this says promotion of a quack bioresonance 
device, the Healy, to treat coronavirus, making up nonsense Healy Medical Board. Fanciful claims, Meridian Bioenergetic. Fanciful claims indeed. Another snippet here. What's this one? With a weird graphic that says COVID 5G, Gates, World Health Organization, everything's in there. New Templars, New Templars. COVID 1DG map fully explained. Interview with Dylan Lewis Monroe. Hmm. Here's one. It says Ovid. O-V-I-D is Latin for sheep. COVID starts with a C, which also means C, S-E-E, in ancient languages. 19 was known as the number of surrender in ancient times. (laughs) C, Ovid, 19 equals C, a sheep, surrender. Mm, Well, that makes about as much sense as just about anything I've seen. Another one here. From a MD, holistic, holistic psychiatrist. Oh yeah. Strand of human hair. It's, it's, a, it's images. Strand of human hair, 15 microns in diameter. And then tiny little coronavirus, 0.12 microns diameter. Then a circle representing the surgical mask. Diameter filtration capacity, 2 to 10 microns. Basically trying to say that the coronavirus is much smaller than the holes in the surgical mask which is an old argument I've heard for about a year now, but of course the virus itself just doesn't waft out all on its lonesome. Another posting on would seem to be Facebook from Sally Ann Scharf. Firstly, viruses are not living organisms or living microbes. They do not have a respiratory system, nor do they have a nucleus or digestive system. Viruses are not alive and viruses are not contagious. (laughs) Oh boy. The fear behind coronavirus, for instance, is wholly unwarranted. Forget everything you think you know about viruses and bacteria. You have been lied to. Well, here's another interesting one from November last year. What the government doesn't tell you. Socializing boosts immunity. Facial expressions are a key component to communication and human connection. The heart's electrical biofield reaches out six feet. Uh Uh-huh. Bacteria are our immune system. Viruses are part of a detoxing mechanism and are not the cause of disease. How about that? Here's another posting somebody's put up. A screen capture that says, It shouldn't be this shocking. Everyone will get this lab-made COVID-19 eventually. 99% infection rate means you're likely to catch it. 99% survival rate means you're likely to live through it. Greater than 1% death rate means you have nothing to worry about. So open everything up already. And that looks like that was from October last year. And, uh, And I think it's safe to say we've seen what happens when societies open up too quickly. And it's never good. And one more for now. A posting. The new vaccine for COVID-19 will be the first of its kind ever. It will be an mRNA vaccine, which will literally alter your DNA. It will warp itself into your system. Warp itself into your system? Like Star Trek? Uh Ahem. You will essentially become a genetically modified human being, complete with an image here of uh, some DNA. Imagine that, a genetically modified human being. Well, they're just some of the many, many, many entries people from around the world have been putting up at coronaconspiracy.cloud. And if you're a journalist and you're interested in writing a story about some of the quackery and misconceptions and nonsense out there, then this site is really worth a visit because it's page after page after page of screen captures, photographs, and other things people have been putting up, all to do with coronavirus conspiracies and nonsense. Again, you can visit that site very easily by going to coronaconspiracy.cloud or simply clicking the link in each week's show notes. (laughs) 
drinking. Hey! Oh, drinks. Hey. Mm, so nice to be back at Skeptics in the Pub. Yes, Richard, it's great that COVID-19 is a thing of the past and we can gather together and not wear masks. Although I, I will occasionally, you know, like, you know, in special situations, you know what I mean, don't you? Mmm, this, this beer tastes better than I remember. And uh, this beer glass is much bigger than I remember. Hmm. Oh, thanks for this. I'll, I'll get the next round. Ah, no need. All the beer is free tonight. Free? <laughs> oh, wow. Did you hear that all the anti-vaxxers and flat earthers have changed their minds? What? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're now busy writing apology letters to the whole world. They're really busy. They're going to have to sharpen their pencil, if you know what I mean. Ah, look. It's Lara coming over here with a, a plate full of food. Hi, you two. Did you know that the food at the bar is free tonight? Anything you want. Really? You have to try the lobster and chips. Lobster and chips? Oh, wow. This is like a dream. And this pub now has recliner chairs, a free foot massage for everyone, and vouchers for Uber rides home. <laughs> wow. Hang on. This seems too good to be true. Who's the guest speaker? It's not bloody Brian Dunning, is it? Let me see. Uh, this is odd. It says here it's the sceptical fairy godmother angel from the internet. The sceptical godmother fairy in... You know, you know, that sounds familiar. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 it up, woman. Hello, everyone. Who are you? Well, you're only 10 centimetres tall. That's about four inches for those of you using the uh, Darth Vader Imperial system. And floating in the air, that can't be right. As Lara said, I'm the sceptical fairy godmother angel from the internet. You ask a silly question. And you're tonight's guest speaker? Well, not really. I have come to tell you that, yes, this is all a dream. Aww. Aww. I thought this was too good to be true. I know we can't meet in pubs at the moment, but that shouldn't stop you from enjoying sceptical talks online. The Vic Skeptics have Skeptics Cafe each month. Sydney has Skeptics in the pub. There are online events from the Gold Coast and... Yes, yes, yes. This all sounds eerily familiar. Have we met before somewhere? Maybe we have. Maybe it was as we watched a live and interactive sceptical talk. All you need do is search for them online, no matter where you are in the world. She's right. I've been watching sceptical talks from the UK, the US, and even one from my own living room. Although that one wasn't very interesting. I fell asleep and I was the speaker. Hang on, hang on. Weren't you once the tooth fairy? <sighs> I'll never live that down. One last question. Yes? Just whose dream is this? <laughs> Mine. Goodbye. Worse <coughs> 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 than sparklers. She disappeared. But um, we're still here, huh? Right. So, um... Lobster and chips, anyone? Oh, yeah, he only pays for food and drinks in the dream. Let me tell you, people... Time to look into the treasure trove at trove.nla.gov.au, the digitised resource of Australian newspapers, gazettes, periodicals, etc. Thousands of digitised articles, complete uh, magazines, complete catalogues of newspapers going back decades and decades and decades. And this week I thought we'd do a search for the term superstitions and I was amazed at how many returns that uh, search resulted in so many but here are a few picked at random from the Queenslander which was published apparently from 1866 to 1939 Saturday the 30th of April, 1921. Superstitions about 
furniture. One day someone will issue an encyclopedia about superstitions, and it will be one of the most voluminous encyclopedias yet published. Such is the credulity of the human race. There are an extraordinary number of superstitions about furniture, says a writer in John O. London's Weekly. Anybody can smash a chair. Maybe an antique of great beauty and value, but nobody will have the shivers. Whereas, if a cheap, ugly looking glass is broken, some people will have fits. In Cornwall, the supposed penalty for such an offence used to be seven years of sorrow. A Yorkshire proverb states that such an accident involves seven years' trouble, but no want. It used to be regarded as a sure indication of the speedy decease of the master of the house, and in Scotland it was regarded as an infallible sign that some member of the family would shortly die. It was supposed to be the height of ill luck to see the new moon reflected in a looking glass through a window pane, and some mothers carefully prevented their youngest child looking on one until a year old. Mirrors were regarded by our forefathers as the most effective means of divining secrets. There is a tradition that the gunpowder plot was discovered by Dr. John Dee, a famous magician of that time, with his magic mirror. There is an old engraving in a prayer book, printed by Bassett in 1737, showing a circular looking glass with a reflection of the Houses of Parliament by night, with a person entering carrying a lantern. There was a popular superstition once, that fine glass such as that of Venice would break if poison were put in it. There is much curious folklore about the bed. Bedsteads were always placed parallel to the planks of the floor, as it was considered unlucky to sleep across the boards. There is a belief among the Hindus that those who sleep with their beds to the north will have their days shortened. Yet some people say they always sleep sounder when their heads are placed to the north, and a Scottish physician once declared that when he failed by every other prescription to bring sleep to invalid children, he recommended their beds be turned due north or south. The phrase, to get out of bed the wrong way, originated in an ancient superstition which regarded it as unlucky to place the left foot first on the ground when getting out of bed. And the next item that comes to us is from the Newcastle Morning Herald and Miner's Advocate, published on the 3rd of March, 1885. Superstitions about the moon. There are a numerous class of influences which popular opinion has imputed to our satellite, and which, however absurd they may be, have prevailed among mankind in almost all countries and throughout all ages. The influence of the moon upon the weather is almost as firmly believed in today as it was a century ago, and should you attempt to deny it, you run the risk of being treated as an infidel, or looked upon as not being exactly square in the upper story. Besides its influence on the weather, the moon is held responsible for a great variety of influences on the organized world. For instance, the circulation of the sap in vegetables, the qualities of grain, the goodness of your vintage, are severally laid to its account, and timber must be planted, transplanted, and felled, the harvest cut down and gathered in, the juice of the grape expressed, and its subsequent treatment regulated, at times, under the circumstances having determined relation to the aspects of the moon, if excellence be looked for in these products of the soil. Pigs must be killed, and their subsequent treatment related also according to the age of the moon. According to popular belief, our satellite also presides over human maladies, and the phenomena of the sick chamber are governed by lunar phases. Nay, the very marrow of our bones and the weight of our bodies suffer increase or diminution under its influence. Nor is 
its influence limited to mere physical and organic effects. It extends its sway into the region of intellectual phenomena and notoriously governs mental derangement. Another prevalent notion in some parts of Europe is that the moon's light is attended with the effects of darkening the complexion. Also, that it facilitates the purification of animal substances and that oysters and other shellfish become larger during the increase than during the decline of the moon. Births are supposed to be influenced by the moon as it is a prevalent opinion that they occur more frequently in the decline of the moon than in her increase. Eggs, it is asserted, should be put to hatch when the moon is new, and fowls are better and more successfully reared when they break the shell at the fall of the moon. Maidens, also wishing to know who their future lord and master is to be, must visit a running stream at midnight by the light of the full moon, repeating the words, Full moon, full moon, reveal to me who my sweetheart is to be. Thereupon the loving swan will appear, if not in substance, at least in shadow. The above are only a few of the superstitious notions prevalent among country people in all parts of Europe regarding the moon's influence, for the knowledge of which I am indebted to Lardner's Museum of Science, WGB, Quebec. The next one comes to us from the Newcastle Morning Herald and Miners Advocate, and this time it's from the 24th of December, 1907. New Year's Superstitions In the north of England, it is considered unlucky for any inmate to go out of the house on New Year's Day until someone from without has entered it, and the first foot across the threshold is watched with great anxiety. The good or bad luck of the house during the year depending on the first comer being a man or a woman. In Lancashire folklore, it is related that should it be a female or a light-haired male be the first to enter a house on the morning of New Year's Day, it is supposed to bring bad luck for the whole year then commencing. Various precautions are taken to prevent this misfortune. Hence, many male persons with black or dark hair are in the habit of going from house to house on that day to take the New Year in, for which they are treated with liquor and presented with a small gratuity. So far, it is the apprehension carried that some families will not open the door to anyone until satisfied by the voice that he is likely to bring the house a year's good luck by entering it. The most kindly and charitable woman in a neighbourhood will strongly refuse to give anyone a light on the morning of New Year's Day, as it is most unlucky to the one who gives it away. As bearing on the last named superstition, it is asserted that in the North Riding of Yorkshire, those who have not the common materials for making a fire generally sit without one on New Year's Day, for none of their neighbours, although hospitable at other times, will suffer them to light a candle at their fires. If they do, it is believed that one of the family will die within the year. Opening a Bible on New Year's Day is a superstitious practice observed in some parts of England, says Brand in his Popular Antiques, and much credit is attached to it. It is unusually set about with some little ceremony on the morning before breakfast, as it must be performed fasting. The Bible is laid on the table unopened, and the parties who wish to consult it are there to open it in succession. They are not at liberty to choose any particular part of the book. They must open it at random. Wherever this may happen to be, the inquirer is to place his finger on any chapter contained in the two pages, but without any previous perusal or examination. It is believed that the good or ill fortune, the happiness or the misery of the consulting party during the ensuing year will be in some way or other described or foreshown by the contents of the chapter. As a rule, although customs, 
the origin of which dates back to the misty days of the dim and distant past, have been transplanted in Australia, with the people of distant lands, superstitions having stayed at home. This new country is not a congenital home for the elves, fairies, witches and warlocks of Europe. There is nowhere for them to hide, for the sun shines all the year round, and the compulsory education system is not friendly to them. I like that last line. That says a lot, actually. The more educated a society is, the less uh, superstitious, by and large. And finally, we come to an article from the Albury Banner and Wodonga Express, published on the 26th of May, 1915. Superstitions of the stage and dressing rooms. If a chorus girl whistles in the dressing room while she is making up for the stage, she is immediately thrust outside, no matter what the state of her attire, made to turn around three times, knock at the door, and apologise on being readmitted. She may sing, shout, dance, or show her merriment in any other form, but whistling is supposed to put a blight on the performance, and only the novices indulge in it. The whistling girl who refuses to apologise is unmercifully ragged. This is one of many curious superstitions which rule among the ladies of the chorus. In the process of making up, a hare's foot is used. The average chorus girl will give almost any sum she possesses to secure for its purpose the foot of a hare that has been shot by moonlight. Of course, these are rarities and many spurious feet are sold, but for a genuine moonlighter, there is always keen competition. Woe betide the girl who brings May blossoms into the dressing room. Any other sort of flower or foliage is tolerated, but not welcomed. But May blossom to a chorus girl is as a red flag to an infuriated bull. Every girl possesses a makeup box, something like a small cash box containing many compartments for the various articles used for the face to counteract the white glare of the footlights. If, during the run of a certain piece of review, she dared clean this out, she is looked upon as Jonah and shunned by her fellow choristers. Ninety out of every hundred chorus girls believe that the stopping of a clock or watch in the dressing room means bad luck. Either it means that the performance will get what is known in the profession as the bird, that is, be booed, hissed, interrupted, or received in stony silence, or that the run of the piece will be short. In the course of a ten or twelve weeks tour of the provinces, the chorus girl travels hundreds of miles free and sees more of the country than the average person with 20 times her income. All her travelling from town to town is done on Sunday. She may have finished at the theatre at midnight, spent two hours at her lodgings in packing ready for the baggage man's call, and get ready to start on the 10 hours journey by 5am. This has left little time for making herself look smart. But if any chorus girl dared, in a moment of forgetfulness, to trim her fingernails on the train, she is shunned for the rest of the journey, because, silly as it may seem to those outside the business, it is believed among the chorus that this act will damage the show for a week. If, while dressing, the chorus girl accidentally puts her foot in any beer or other intoxicant which has been spilled on the floor she considers her luck is in even though she herself may be a strict teetotaler a theatrical landlady with red hair and a cross eye may as well shut up shop as far as letting to chorus girls is concerned they will have none of her and i've yet to find the girl of the chorus who will sleep in a room where there are flowers unless they are artificial. She may well incur the anger of the stage manager if her stocking is put on the wrong side purely by mistake, but the average chorus girl would mutiny rather than change it, because she firmly believes that in doing so she would change her luck, 
which is more to her than an official wigging. And it's interesting to note that the last paragraph I read, as originally published, I would imagine, is mixed up. It's really strange. The first line, she may incur the anger of the stage, is correct. The next line is written upside down. Not back to front, purely upside down, and that line is should be about four lines further on. And the following line is also wrong. So it's one line is upside down and the rest are in the wrong order. So it took a little while for me to, <laughs> to decipher that. How strange is that? Well, there you are, just a selection of the many results that come back when we look for superstitions in the pages of Australian journals and magazines and newspapers. And you can read that for yourself by going to trove.nla.gov.au, searching for superstitions or anything you like, and having a very interesting time in reading the results. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. Now, it's Sunday here in Australia, Sunday the 4th, and this evening live, yes, live on Facebook at 8.30 Sydney time, and the clocks just went back last night. So keep that in mind if you're listening internationally. Anyway, 8.30 tonight, Sydney time, Maynard is doing a live quiz online on Facebook book and you can find out more by visiting maynard.com.au it's maynard's we don't care quiz and i will be in the background on the quiz uh reading out your answers to maynard's questions lots of fun very silly of course it's maynard what do you expect check it out if you can join us live tonight sydney time that would be great A couple of weeks ago on the show, you would have heard Adrian Hill talking about the Great Australian Prediction Project, something that's been going on for quite a few years now. I'll be giving a talk about that project for the Canberra Skeptics. Canberra Skeptics proudly present the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project. Now, this will be Tuesday, the 13th of April at 6 p.m. here in, uh, in Australia. Canberra time, Sydney time, Melbourne time, Brisbane time. It's all the same at the moment. And for more information on how to book your place for that talk by me, just visit CanberraSkeptics.org, a link in this week's show notes. And coming up in May for the Canberra Skeptics, another talk, What is Humanism? And that will be on the 12th of May. A talk by Anne-Marie Cosgrove. It's a Zoom talk. For tens, even hundreds of thousands of years, humans have been wondering about their place in the universe Mm -hmm. and pondering fundamental questions about their existence, such as, how can I understand the world? How can I find meaning and fulfillment in life? How can I find comfort when I am grieving? How do I deal with fear of my own death? Oh, it's a bit serious. How should I behave? What is right and what is wrong? For information on those two talks, again, just visit CanberraSkeptics.org. Thank you to the people who continue to support The Skeptic Zone at SkepticZone.tv via Patreon or PayPal. Much appreciated. In fact, my monthly Patreon money will be coming in tomorrow, the next day, something like that. And that helps pay the bills here at The Skeptic Zone. And thank you to those people who have bought some of my digital prints of uh, photography from my online store, and you can get to that store by going to skepticzone.tv, scrolling to the bottom of the page, where you can get some free samples of my uh, digital photography to download off Wiki, and then check out the store, and you might want to uh, buy one or two. And that, of course, helps keep the show going. But now it's time for me to be going. So until next week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. 
Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. Hello to the people who listen after the music, the afterthoughts. Keep thinking. This is the part of the show where I roll a die, usually three times, actually usually four times, and you guess what number's going to come up. This week it's a D10, very green D10. Now I mentioned earlier, before the music, that uh, my online store has photography. One of the photographs, or no, a couple of the photographs, are of some of the dice I use So you can check that out. Anyway, guess the way I'm going to roll it three times originally, and then we'll do a fourth just for fun. I'm going to write these down. Here comes the first number out of uh, ten. Here we go. In my dice rolling machine. Ten is the first number. Did you get ten? Here comes the second one. Six. And third roll, one, very evenly spread today. And the supplementary, the extra number at the end, just for fun. Another one. Here we go, folks. The numbers you want are ten, six, one, and one. And a bird out the window.